Hello, everyone. Welcome to Co-Mentor Office Hours. Um, today, we're very excited to have Craig McKeechee here with us today. Craig is the author of the JavaScript Framework Guide, and today we'll be talking about AngularJS, Backbone, Ember, choosing your religion. Let's get started. Well, I just want to start by saying you're not supposed to talk about religion, so we're just not going to talk about any things he just said we're going to talk about. No. Um, all joking aside, a uh, little bit about myself. Um, I mostly come from a .NET background, have uh, dabbled in Rails and PHP a bit over the years. Uh, in the past year or so, I've been pretty much full-time um, getting up to speed on JavaScript and trying to learn the frameworks. But you know, I definitely come from more of a enterprise background. Um, I did consulting for years, though, and ended up at a few interactive agencies. So I, I like to think you know, I can understand most people's perspectives you know, if you come from more of a creative media perspective or more of an enterprise side, um, I try to be, you know, open to all those thoughts. Um, so again, I spent, you know, most of the last year uh, writing the book and, uh, and now I'm uh, doing some corporate training on AngularJS um, and Ember at times. So um, that's a little bit about me. Um, I've gotten some questions here. So you want to say hi to everybody. So take a second. I know everybody's on mute except for me. So. Um, I appreciate all the great questions and the interest in the topic. Sometimes, you know, when you write a book about something like this, you think that everybody's kind of moved past this choice and has chosen this framework or that framework and that the interest has died down. But it's nice to see that people are still trying to make an educated decision for themselves uh, and, uh, and get educated on it. Um, I, I got some good questions. I'm just going to start off. I don't know. So some of the best ones maybe jump a little ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into them and, and start addressing things. So um, uh, from Satish, uh, do you want to ask your question, perhaps? I thought that was a pretty good one. Um, hey, uh, thanks for uh, uh, you know, looking at my question. Um, I, I definitely have a startup. We are just kind of trying to uh, build an enterprise platform. So. We are in the process of designing the front end framework. So I was kind of very much excited to you know hear your uh, thoughts about the frameworks. And okay. hopefully it gives us an understanding of what should we uh, choose. Yeah, and I think you know, unfortunately it always has to be it depends because you know if I came up here and said this one's better than this one. I think it would be, you know, being disingenuous. I think it's all about the perspective of where you're coming from is what I, what I try to talk about. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, but, let's, but let's dig into that a little bit. So let's talk about some real pros and cons. So there's a, there's yeah. a chapter in the book where I literally, you know, dig in and talk about uh, pros and cons. There we go. Someone muted themselves off again. Um, and so just to kind of give you some highlights, one thing that, um, you know, a lot of people have a lot of good things to say about Angular. Um, can everybody still hear me? Just nod your heads if you can. Okay. Because it went a little quiet on my side. Um, when, you, when you think about Angular, there's, let, let's start with some of the obvious pros, right? So there's testing, right? So if you're in an enterprise shop, particularly with a Java background or Ruby on Rails background, you're gonna really like the testing story in AngularJS now. Everybody kind of knows that, but I mean, it, it goes beyond what I've seen in any web framework. So, you know, it got to the point where you know, new web frameworks might support testing, but you know, Angular literally has dependency injection built into the core of the framework. So um, that allows you, if you really care about testing, you know, that's, that's a big plus on the Angular side. Um, so, Another thing to think about, you know, from the, a big pro on the Angular side is, is just sort of the vision. So lately, I think we're going to, I'm going to field some other questions about the Angular 2.0 stuff, but they've all sort of been pushing the envelope on, you know, browser support, you know, AKA dropping browser support for, for browsers aggressively in newer versions, um, thinking about mobile before um, other people uh, or aggressively about mobile, thinking about ES6 before other people, um, you know, supporting, trying to support um, web components. Uh, you know, Ember is in a very similar camp, but very, very forward thinking and has, has a lot of vision. Um, 
some cons just to, you know, there's, there's plenty of things on this list. I wrote a 270 page book, so, you know, we can go on both sides, but I'm trying to name some of the big ones. Some cons on the AngularJS side um, are namely that, that a lot of people don't realize is the, the router that was, is built into AngularJS. Most people in sort of enterprise or production situations don't actually use that router. I know there's a code mentor office hours that I was just uh, listening to part of before this to see, you know, what kinds of questions people ask from Dean Sofer, who was, uh, you know, in charge of the Angular UI project. Uh, there's a particular component of the Angular pro UI project called the Angular UI router. And basically, this allows you to do two things that, um, that are common in more robust routers in an MVC framework, and they are named views and nested views. So named views is, you know, if you're going to divide your page up into a header and a footer and a sidebar and, you know, a left nav, go ahead, and a left nav and so forth, you, you know, basically these um, named views allows you to do that and still have a, like an isolated set of code and a controller in Angular's case um, and a scope to, to each of those pieces and then kind of compose them up. Um, the other thing is nested views. So this means the, the example I always like to give is the master detail example. Ember plays this up quite a bit because Ember's router in the box is very strong. We'll talk about that more. But Ember's, you know, built-in router is, is uh, you know, sort of as a recognized strength. And, but this idea of um, nested views is basically if you have a list and then you have a detail or a list in an edit form, this sort of thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's perfectly fine, like, you know, picture like in a Ruby on Rails app or something, you might have the list as a slash list route and then a slash, you know, details with the ID for the, the details page. But in the real world, what happens is people want the list and the details um, on the same page. They might want the list on the left-hand side. And then when you click an item, you might want to drill into the details and, um, and show these things. And you, they want more complex interactions like this. And this is, um, this is possible with just the basic Angular router, but you basically are hiding and showing things. So it's sort of not um, native or, you know, a, you don't have the ability to put the code in its own isolated place for the detail view and put the list view in its own isolated place. When you can nest routes, you can basically say this detail route is underneath this list route. And then that allows you to, you know, to compose those or pull them apart or put other components in with them in this sort of nested hierarchy, um, which is super, super powerful. So the, the main con of Angular is that, you know, the built-in router right now, it's being rewritten for the new version of the framework, um, or has been, I just, it hasn't been released, um, obviously two hours away off, we can talk about that, but, but that's sort of a weakness, but it's quickly erased by simply using another open source project, but to be fair, when you're comparing framework to framework straight up, Ember, you know, was the first there with a really strong router um, in that space and, and it, they support sort of this concept of, of nested and, and named routes when you're thinking about frameworks. I could go on and, and on about um, frameworks. Let, let me throw a couple more highlights out there and then try to move on and maybe we'll come back to it and, and, and bring some stuff up. Um, so Ember, you know, obviously the router, it's a full state machine, just like the Angular UI router, which is a separate project than Angular, is a full state machine. So that, that's a real strength of Ember. Um, they have a, they've um, done pretty well with the, their uh, vision, uh, you know, seeing object.observe beforehand, kind of, I believe, following an Angular's path and thinking about web components early. Um, their component model, uh, you know, another weakness of Angular is directives. I think a lot of people will talk about how difficult it is to write a directive. So um, particularly, you know, there's different kinds of directives in Angular. Um, so Angular is, you know, rec you know, talked about this and fixing this in the newer versions, but, but that's definitely a weakness of, um, of Angular and a pro of Ember because Ember has a component model. So this idea of, if you think of the word component to mean web component, um, components in Ember are much simpler than directives because they're not trying to do as much. They're trying to be that UI widget or that UI component. And um, so the API is much simpler and cleaner and easier to understand. So they, they definitely got that right. Um, some of the cons I see um, mentioned of Ember are the fact that, you know, they don't do this uh, dirty checking that uh, is common in Angular, which we can elaborate on later. But, um, but 
they use getters and setters, you need to, to remember to access properties on your objects through getters and setters. And so this is, um, this can, you know, basically be a pain because sometimes you forget and you actually just dot to a property and, and you get a strange bug in the application and you, you know, can spend some time trying to track that down. So it's not as natural as having properties that are just a raw, plain old JavaScript object um, as they are in Angular. I'm starting to feel like a little bit, um, I'm gonna go with a couple backbone pros and cons, but we kind of went to the punchline. Maybe I chose the wrong first question there. Uh, we jumped to the punchline and uh, so there's, you know, I may have left some people in the dust there, some people who've been studying this problem for a while, but, but uh, so maybe I can go back and try to explain uh, some basics uh, here in a minute if I lost you. So I know some people are probably following very easily, but, um, but uh, for those I left behind, hopefully we'll come back and, and pick up on some, some of the basic concepts. Uh, backbone, pros and cons. So Backbone is really a much smaller thing. So the way I like to talk about Backbone is it's more of a library than a framework. So it's not trying to put as much opinion on you. It's not trying to do as much. It's not helping you as much. It's not writing as much of your code for you. Um, but on the other side, if you're a person who's really comfortable in JavaScript and just doesn't want a framework that gets in the way, you don't want to run into performance bottlenecks, you know, in say the data binding of a framework, then, you know, looking at something like Backbone or, uh, you know, you might be more comfortable with that. that. I personally, um, you know, have a hard, have had a hard time sort of warming up to it because I learned some of the other frameworks first. And I think I have a bent, you know, personally towards, uh, you know, productivity. Um, and that's not to say that you're not productive with um, Backbone, but you, you certainly have a lot more code to write. Um, and it comes a large part from the fact that there's, there's no data binding there, basically. So the two-way data binding, not no data binding, but there's not two-way data binding. That is a, you know, a key feature that a lot of people really like in the other two frameworks. This does you give you more control over the performance, particularly in mobile scenarios and so forth. But, um, but there's just not as much there um, to help you, you know, write the app faster. You know? But that's not always uh, uh, everyone's first priority. Um, there's a ton of other... Um, you know, a lot of people like, don't like a framework to get in their way, like, uh, like Backbone. And so, so Backbone, you know, really doesn't have a strong opinion, even to the point, though, where, you know, architecture um, is unclear at times of, you know, where you're supposed to put things. And, you know, there, there are problems with that in the other frameworks as well. But uh, it, can be, it can be challenging to kind of get up to speed on some of that stuff. Another big con I found of Backbone is it feels to me much easier to leak uh, memory um, in that framework uh, when you're writing applications. So if you don't know what you're doing um, with JavaScript, if you're not, if you don't think of yourself as a JavaScript guru, this may not be the framework, you know, for you. Uh, another strength I like to point out of the backbone is the whole idea that, you know, if you're, if you're in a project, you don't think anything these days of bringing in jQuery to that project. You don't have a you know, corporate meeting and try to decide what library you're going to bring in and so forth. So if you have a legacy or a brown, more of a brownfield app and not sort of a greenfield new app, um, Backbone can be, it is a super small light library. It is not a big framework. And I think bringing it into a project does, you know, it is, it is very light. So, you know, I would, you know, if I'm, at a corporate enterprise job and we haven't really decided on our framework and I've got this jQuery code that's getting to be a, a big mess and I feel like I need something else, I really would strongly consider turning to, to Backbone um, to refactor that, that code and clean it up and get some more um, modularity around the things you're doing. So sorry, that was, that was a big mouthful. I think I should let some other people talk. So on the things I've talked about before I move on to other questions that people are asking, what are some comments, feedback on that? I threw a lot of, a lot of broad statements out there. So feel free to chime in, respond. Don't be shy. There's only about 80 other people in here, right? How many people are in here? Um, so I know I put a lot on you. Um, trying to figure out. <laughs> so, uh, I get a comment. It sounds like you prefer Angular. Would, would that be correct? I would say, yeah, I've had a hard time warming up to Backbone. 
Um, I would say, you know, as far as Angular and Ember go, I would, I would say it's a, a reasonable choice to choose either. And there are good reasons for, for a company choosing either of those frameworks. But um, I like to talk about the generations of, you know, what's happened in, in building rich JavaScript applications. So let me run through that real quick. And that'll help you understand why I'm saying, well, I'm not just an Angular guy. I, I'm, I'm an Angular or Ember person. And he, here, here's where it comes from. Okay, so I think there are generations of these frameworks. Um, so there was plain old JavaScript, right? And nobody wanted to write JavaScript when it was just JavaScript. Everybody was afraid of it because of all the cross browser issues. Then jQuery came along and you know, jQuery can be you know, summarized, a lot of people consider it as a DOM manipulation library. So it enabled people to not be afraid of those cross browser issues. Um, you know, and with its nice Ajax API, it enabled a lot of things. Um, and that was sort of a second step uh, in the evolution of building richer JavaScript application. Then I feel like the third generation of things come along was uh, Backbone and Knockout. And when those came along, you know, basically at that point, people were realizing that they're, you know, when they wrote the jQuery applications, um, they weren't able to reuse code across pages. They felt like they were just writing these nested, you know, you can write good jQuery code, but it's, it's not leading you into the pit of success all the time. You can write sort of a, a collection of nested um, functions. Um, you know, we've got promises in jQuery now, so that's getting better. Um, but you can quickly kind of um, break the back button by making a few Ajax calls with your jQuery code. You can quickly, uh, you, 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 if you're trying to build more and more of your app in JavaScript, you kind of hit the, the edge of jQuery. In other words, if you want to totally change the page out but keep a clean URL to something or make the back button work, you, at that point, um, you know, you, people were starting to want more of a framework to help them on the client side when they're building their, their JavaScript applications. So that I feel like is when, um, and, and during that same time, you know, I put Backbone and Knockout in the same category because Knockout kind of came along and, uh, you know, I don't know if it was the first one or if Angular was about the same time, but it, it just really focused on um, data binding on the client side and people really, you know, like this and became more productive because of this. So there was sort of this, you know, we really like this data binding and knockout. I really like the ideas that I need something more like a router and uh, more organization of my code and some events and so forth and backbone. And then, then sort of the next evolution of frameworks came along that kind of codified all these ideas and brought them into more of a inclusive framework and less of a library. There was all these sort of micro um, competing frameworks against Backbone, and I feel like, you know, Backbone won, but then people wanted more, and that's when AngularJS and Ember came about. So I think that, you know, if you think about these as generations of stuff, I feel like, you know, if I'm using tools, I want to be on the newer generation of things. Now, there are exceptions to that. For example, um, you know, one common exception is uh, performance. There's a lot of magic happening for you in Backbone, I'm sorry, in uh, Angular and Ember, and so with, with this magic happening, particularly a data binding front, you can run into some performance concerns, particularly on the mobile side uh, with these uh, frameworks. Um, and they've sort of recognized it in you know, the newest version a couple of weeks ago of Angular that came out, 1.3. If you hear the team talk, the, the major feature was really performance on that. So they were recognizing it. If you look at what the Ember team's doing besides build tools um, more recently, they uh, there's this HTML bars project, um, which sort of revolutionized their, their, their data binding approach and their um, approach to the DOM and how they, you know, basically their templating engine. And it, it's gotten a lot faster in that way too. So I think, you know, the early versions of those frameworks, definitely if you were, you know, in a mobile scenario particularly, and if you had a lot of items on a page, you really could start hitting the edges of, of performance problems with the frameworks. Whereas, you know, if you had something like Backbone, you were, um, you probably wouldn't run into that because you have this really, you're really close to the metal and you have this fine grain control over things. So it kind of depends on what you're doing with the framework. So I'm going to try to read back through here some questions. People have been making comments, but I'm not a very good multitasker. So I've been spouting off. Let's see if anybody's, uh, what people are saying.
Okay. So here's one that's kind of related to what I was just talking about. You know, uh, how about um, Beck Soy? Um, ask Beck Soy, would you want to come on and ask the question? If you don't, he asked the question privately, so I'm not sure if he feels comfortable coming on and asking. But if you want to unmute yourself and ask, that'd be fine. Otherwise, I'll just kind of repeat it here in a second. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't, it wasn't meant to be private. I, just <laughs> I guess I forgot to pick all. Anyway, uh, for someone who is not an advanced JS developer and is at the point of learning their first framework as they are advancing in their uh, JavaScript learning path, it was recommended in, in a track, uh, in a learning path, uh, that that one one learns backbone. It gives them the flexibility. You know, it has the handlebars templating for mm -hmm. the UI and so forth. Um, I don't know enough to compare it to Angular or or Ember. Um, I heard uh, Ember can be very complex. Angular can be more simplistic. Google is behind it. It's going to be more long lasting. And then I get this recommendation. So anyway, someone who's on a learning path, um, what's that was recommended? But what's your opinion on on on, on that? Someone, yeah, I think it's a, I, I, definitely from a learning path perspective. Like I almost wish I'll tell you, my learning path was I went straight from you know jQuery to Angular, then I jumped back to Backbone, and then learned Ember. And if I had to do it again. I think it would have been um, a much better experience for me to have learned Backbone first, because you kind of you you kind of get slowly moved into this JavaScript MVC. Now, I don't know if that means learning it inside out. Um, there's a lot of people that could be up in arms at that comment and say you're just wasting your time. You know wh why learn this stuff that you know doesn't matter. But it's kind of close learning raw JavaScript. Um, for someone who just joined the call, um, if you're not going to ask a question, please uh, mute yourself for a little bit. There's a lot of, there we go. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I just get it. I've got these earbuds in, so I get it really loud. I don't know if other people hear the same thing. Yeah. Same but, here. yeah. Um, so, so I don't think that's a bad, especially from a learning perspective, that's not bad. I think it leads me into kind of talking about, um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen and see if I totally screw things up here real quick, but I have a, um, depending on where you're at in your uh, learning path, okay, let's share my Chrome tools. Can everybody see my blog there with my ugly mug? Yeah. Craig, by the way, you kind of gave me the answer that I, I wanted to hear. Okay. <laughs> because I was feeling that exact same thing, and I was thinking the reason uh, it made sense to me to learn Backbone first was it was more um, getting one prepared for the MVC uh, the kind of like the raw MVC concepts. Right. And I think, yeah, let's flip over a couple. So uh, is everybody seeing my browser window? Yes. Now can you nod if they see it, you see it, do you see a Chrome or you just see me still? I'm sorry. I can't see the chat window. Yep, Somebody nod your head. Yep. 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 Okay. Thank you guys. Um, so, on my blog, I wrote, uh, you know, JavaScript frameworks, how to learn them quickly. I actually rewrote this article for SitePoint as well. So if you Google around for my name at SitePoint, you'll run across a version of this. But basically, the way I, th the reason I'm pushing, not to push people to my blog, but more to just um, give some concrete examples to some things. Um, so I like to think about the frameworks broken down into features, you know, when you're starting to learn things. And, um, and that really informs a lot of, uh, uh, forms a lot of understanding that's not there. A lot of people don't talk about what the frameworks do for you. It's just as vague. This one's better. This one has, you know, lacks this. This one's look forward looking, you know, like I kind of gave you these broad statements. If you don't have some context within which to digest those, then it's, it's just a whole lot of um, opinion, you know, about things. So the one thing I like to talk about is, you know, the features. So routing is one feature. So this is the idea that you know, if you're in a client side app, what's happening is that you're virtually switching between pages on the client side. So whenever you click a link or change a URL in the address bar, your, um, that URL change, that window.location change is being intercepted on the client and a new virtual page is being, uh, template is being loaded with, with new data. So the page changing has, has moved from the server to the client. So here's, um, 
don't know how well we can show this, but here, here in Backbone is a really simple, you know, example of this. And I heard that the side went well. So, you know, I'm switching between this home and this about page. It's the simplest, simplest example, right? Um, what, what you're getting with a router, you know, when we're talking about the router feature, is you're getting, when I go to this path, you know, when I go to the default route, um, then I'm going to load this view, you know, forgetting I can't teach, you know, entirely backbone and so forth, but I go to this view and I load this HTML. So it's this idea that the route maps to a function or some JavaScript code that loads my, my new view in. So there's this, this piece of a JavaScript framework that is the router. So it's just like a server side frameworks MVC router. It's just happening on the client. So here's what that looks like in um, Backbone, right? So let's look at what that looks like in Angular. So just looking at it real quickly, not trying to understand every line of code, you know, here's a route provider. When you go to this path, you run the code in this controller and you load this template, right? When we go back to the Backbone example, it's kind of the same thing. It's like run this function, which we load this view, which is some HTML template under, you know, has an HTML template under the hood. And then you take, you know, some, div on the page and replace the HTML with that view's content. So it's this idea that you're, um, you know, it's a way to dynamically load content into a page to switch pages virtually, basically. Okay. And I apologize if people are, you know, way beyond this in their frameworks, but I, I always like to keep people, you know, on the same level of, of understanding. So, um, so let's look at that in Ember. Okay. So, Ember's big on convention, right? So you're going to have less code here. Um, so people immediately say, oh, this is, this is better. And it, it, it is in some ways, but it's, it's embracing that idea. If you like a framework with a lot of convention, then, then this is kind of for you. So you say route home and route to about, and it's you know, kind of assuming the paths and, and so forth via convention here and switching you between them. Um, so the idea is that you know, there are these pieces and then I'll go down. So this article has like, you know, data binding in it. And then, uh, you know, talks about um, what data binding looks like in Angular, you know, two-way data binding, what it looks like in Knockout, what it looks like in Backbone. So just seeing things, you know, for what they are, you know, seeing that these are the features that this framework's bringing to me. And this is the syntax that they bring forth um, to send these things. What you start seeing is that these frameworks are a lot more, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, um, so that my blog is funnyant.com and that article's, you know, the URL is JavaScript hyphen frameworks. Um, if anybody wants to refer to that, but, the, but the idea is that you're sharing, once you understand these basic features and I, on this call, I don't think we really have time to go over all of them. Um, but once you understand what they are, you can kind of look at all the frameworks in a much more unbiased perspective and you can see that they're a lot more alike than they're different. So to me, it's not, useless to learn any of them in that, you know, once you get it, you get it, right? Like, you know, the new version of Angular, you might not, which a lot of people are asking about, and we'll get to that. Um, you know, it, it becomes this, um, I guess we have a chat window here. I could paste the link in there so people don't have to chase that down. Um, but the, um, it becomes this, you know, realization, you know, this eye opening when I was like learning all the frameworks where it's like, these are all trying to solve the same problem. They're not that different. You know, everybody wants you to believe theirs is better or theirs is different. And they are, they have pros and cons, you know, and so forth. But you, what you really need to get is the concept of, you know, the single page application and what's in a JavaScript MVC framework that helps you build a single page application. Uh, and so I think that that is, that's an important thing, uh, differentiation. Um, before we go deep into, you know, framework stuff, there's one more picture I like to show pull up. Um, so I'm going to pull up this couple charts for a book. And again, for people who are not new to these frameworks and single page applications, this is going to be um, easy, common stuff. But I think that it has value um, in just sort of setting a general architectural um, idea. So let's see. I'm going to share my whole desktop now. So you may see yourself be, be concerned here, people. All right. So let me pull up preview here. Okay. So is everybody seeing page eight of my JavaScript framework guide here now? And I say that, but of course I can't 
the flip over here to see if people are saying, somebody nod their head if they are or say yes. Yep, okay, good, okay. So let me flip back over there. Preview window, okay. We'll try to blow this up a little bit. Mm, that's not working. So the idea here, if, if people can make this out, is that this is how we traditionally build server-side web applications. You know, an HTTP request gets made from the browser to, to the web server. You know, there's talk, you know, there's often many layers in between here and lots of architecture going on. Um, I'm not trying to um, belittle that in any way. I'm just trying to, you know, set the tone for how, how is a single page application different than these traditional server-side web applications. So you get data back to your web server and it's dynamically, um, you know, using some sort of templating engine, it's dynamically put into, into an HTML template on the server and then HTML goes back to the client. Now contrast this with client-side web applications or single page applications. So what's happening here is, um, you know, you make that same um, request to the server, but uh, JavaScript sort of hijacks that request for a new page. And it, at some point, either at the beginning of the life cycle of the application or at the, at the point when the page uh, changes, it pulls down an HTML template to the client with, you know, the dynamic pieces not replaced. It's just static HTML at that point. And then the server is um, job on the other side over here. So the server's job becomes send down static templates and send me, create, you know, a nice web API, a nice uh, RESTful based API and send back some JSON to me. And so when somebody changes pages in a client side application um, or clicks a button, um, JavaScript intercepts that and says, okay, what template do I need to switch in here? Oh, I've already got it down here on the client or I need to make an XHR request up to go get that uh, template. And then I need to make a, I need some data to go into that template. Let me make um, an Ajax call, an XHR request up to the server and get that data back. And then right here on the client, the templating engine has moved to the client. And here I'm gonna put these two pieces together. So, um, that is sort of the, the big high level, you know, change that's happening. And there's lots of ways, you know, to do a single page app. You can send uh, tidbits of HTML back, but all these frameworks we're talking about, they take this same architectural approach where they're saying, um, I'm combining a template uh, in JavaScript on the client with some data, basically. Okay. Um, let me flip my screen back over here and we'll start looking at some questions. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Okay, so hopefully that, that catches some people up, you know, who might have been a little lost when I started going deep into, here's this pro, here's this con, you know, that, that sort of thing. I get a, it's a Mac, eh? And so I can tell you that, yeah, as a 15-year a .NET developer, I have recently come over to the Mac side and uh, I'm still, the jury's still out, but uh, I'm trying to, trying to be open-minded about, uh, about all kinds of platforms, so yep. Um, so let's see here. Um, so there's a good question. Better documentation for beginning curve. So the learning curve, right? There's a lot of, a lot of questions about the learning curve, right? Um, I think the learning curve is, is big across all frameworks. Um, a lot of frameworks have have different you know pros and cons around this like the documentation for angular used to just be awful almost comical like you know there was um you know basically they allowed free comments in the footer of it and sometimes a lot of times the comments in the angular js documentation would be have have what you needed and you know as and you'd have to dig through 10 comments to see it um and uh it's pretty funny. There's, there's a, anybody noticing the baby that's on screen? <laughs> the baby's famous. Um, and so you would have to dig through a lot of stuff, but basically, you know, long story short, they recognize that they put the effort. <laughs> he'll be a coder. Um, they put the effort into, um, into fixing that problem with their documentation and, and the angular JS docs are much, much, much better. Not to mention the community around angular is so big that, you know, if you ask something on Stack Overflow, you're going to get it answered in no time. There's, you know, use groups. There's, you know, it's, it's just very big because there's a lot of people using it, right? When you look at, um, 
you know, something like Ember, their actual, you know, documentation site itself is, I think, very, very well written. I think it's written by Tom Dale, who's, you know, one of the big um, creators of the framework. And so, you know, he's, he, they know that that's important and they've done a really good job with it. But um, when it comes to sort of getting questions answered, um, I at least found it more difficult to find the answers on Stack Overflow and so forth. And I think it has a lot to do with, um, you know, just the number of um, people using the framework. And it's not that it's not a big framework. It's just not quite as many people as Angular where, you know, the answer is, is very, very easy to find. Um, learning curve though. So I'm kind of talking about documentation and not learning curve. But Angular, it depends on what your background is, right? If you're coming from a Java enterprise background or a .NET enterprise background where you use IOC containers every day and know what dependency injection is, then you're going to think this is no problem. If you're, um, you know, coming from a different background, maybe a more uh, creative media background and you can code CSS circles around me and, and, and jQuery plugins, you know, around me, but yet you, um, you don't, um, you're not used to all this enterprisey type stuff, then, you know, it's going to be more of a challenge to, to learn something like Angular, basically. Um, Backbone, you know, is small, like I said, so it is pretty simple to, to get. Um, so that, uh, that's one piece. So we're getting a lot more questions here. I feel like I'm falling behind. So let me go back and see. So someone asked, uh, how about, how about Steven? Steven uh, Schmatz, ask a question. If you want to unmute yourself and ask, and, uh, ask it to everybody. Okay, so essentially what I asked was, uh, are there any advantages to using a server-side app as opposed to a single page client-side app? Or is it, is it more modern? Is it like unilaterally better now? What, what are the main like, pros and cons to both of those? Right. I think it's a good question, particularly because of a couple points. So, um, you know, one thing I like to say is when I'm thinking about, um, when I'm thinking about should I do a server side app or not, I ask myself, is SEO important? And if SEO is really important to that app, I would really shy away from any of these frameworks. And that's kind of a bold statement, but I've, um, uh, it's, it, it basically comes down to the fact that, you know, Google, even though, take Angular comes from Google, um, it, they just don't do a good job. Um, there are solutions to this, but they don't do a good job crawling JavaScript. So what you have to do is you have to build in a process where you run like Phantom JS or some sort of, um, you know, JavaScript uh, on the server that basically renders your page statically and then sends that back when the user agent is Google. And so you can easily mess this up and totally mess up your SEO. So I'm not saying you know, if you have a shopping cart application, you know, you have a store, I'm not saying, hey, don't use, I'm fine, you know, I would be fine, use Angular in the checkout to make that checkout experience, you know, just awesome. But I would really think about it before using it on the product pages, basically. Um, so, and that's, that's not just Angular, that's all these frameworks have this common weakness, basically. Um, trying to think, so, uh, so another, so there's a whole, you know, slew of other things, but I think that's an important one to make everybody aware of. Um, Server-side rendering uh, versus the other. So I think what I, what I just, you know, do you build a server-side app in Rails or ASP.NFVC or, you know, Java or PHP, um, Java Spring or something like that versus, you know, do you build one of these client-side rich applications? And I think the answer comes down to you know, do you need this like handcrafted, awesome wooden chair, you know, that's just like a work of art? Or do you need like a chair from Ikea? And if you need the chair from Ikea, you might, you know, you just need to bang something out and you need a chair, right? Then, then you know, I'm, I would still be considering keeping it up on the server. Um, if you need, if you need that awesomeness, you know, if, if somebody's paying you to create that awesome and you feel like, you know, you get buy-in from whoever your corporate sponsor is and says, you know, I, I want the awesome. I'm ready for an app that's really responsive and it's more like a, a desktop, uh, an experience akin to a desktop app, basically, um, is the, the best way I've heard it put. Then, you know, then I would definitely, you're, you're going to just be fighting an uphill battle if your client, as far as requirements, is asking you for, to build something that's more like a desktop app, then you're going to be much happier um, 
you know, with one of these frameworks, basically. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so tons of question. Okay. So there was a great question that was asked at the beginning. I'm sure a lot of people wonder about the whole Angular 2.0 thing, right? So let's, let me look for that. There's one version, I just wanna make sure. Yeah, maybe Alex uh, Hutchinson, if you wanna come on and ask that question. I think that you were the first person to ask. Hey, how's it going? Good. Um, so I guess my question is, um, given that uh, Google during the like NG Europe conference uh, announced that Angular 2.0 is going to be kind of vastly different than the current like 1.x spec, um, mm -hmm. does it make sense to learn Angular at, in its current state or wait for the 2.0 version to come about? Right. I definitely think it makes sense to learn it now. And here's why. I think it makes sense to learn it now because you need to build apps now, right? And I think that from everything I've heard from the Google team, it's at least late next year is when I would guess uh, Angular 2.0 is gonna come out. So that's a whole year of software development that you're waiting for you know, the next best thing you know, kind of deal. Um, and they just released a version. You know, they just released 1.3 of the framework. So it's not like, you know, you're not getting you know, some new features and so forth. Um, I do, I see the syntax differences, right? I see the drastic differences. I see the ES6 stuff in, in it. Um, I think that they're going to react to um, people having a negative reaction to it and bring it closer to the current framework or they're gonna, they don't wanna lose you know, the, the, the big user base they have, the big community they have. So they're going to, um, Make a, make a migration path um, that works. Um, if you wanna hear, um, there's some, they have definitely taken a few back steps since you know, all the, the, the recent controversy at NG Europe. I think the best synopsis of this, I'm a big podcast guy. Um, I don't know if anybody, there's a series of podcasts on devchat.tv. Um, I can link them in here. Let me, let me find the link here. So on devchat TV, there's an Adventures in Angular podcast. Um, there's a, they also host the JavaScript Jabber podcast, which is more, you know, framework agnostic. Um, but there's a um, DevChat TV. They basically had the entire Angular team, like Miskoff Hevery, Igor Minor, um, all the people on there talking about, you know, this, these whole issues of uh, forward, uh, you know, are they going to support backwards compatibility? So rather than, you know, speak for them, I think I still feel okay, you know, learning that they're going to come out of this okay, you know, um, maybe a little scarred, maybe Ember's going to catch up a little bit, um, but I but I still feel okay, you know, about it. Um, but to hear it from their mouths, I think would really help. So so I'd point people towards towards that resource. But I think you know I've got to build apps today. Um, I know I do training for really large banks and so forth that um, I can't mention the name of, but basically those banks, uh, you know, they're moving all their apps to Angular. Right, they're a Java shop. They're moving all their apps over to Angular, and they're um, they even have like IE8 problems. So they they're going to be moving to Angular 1.2 um, because 1.3 you know drops a lot of the um, IE8 uh, drops IE8 support. So I think there is going to be a huge community of people that are building tons of apps in these current versions of Angular forever. So I'm I'm fine you know, learning more about it and learning deeply every day myself. Awesome. Thank you for answering that. Sure. Um, so somebody, if somebody could do me a favor and uh, find on dev chat TV while I'm answering questions uh, or, you know, it's the adventures in angular podcast, the most recent podcast and paste that in there, or, or we can do it after the show and put the links up on the site, but I would definitely recommend, um, you know, that show for, for getting more information on that. So uh, someone asked, what do you think about React? I saw some people use React plus Flux plus Backbone. So I did get this question a lot when I first released the book because uh, you know, React had done a lot of um, catching up. Thanks, Tony, for putting that link in there. Um, the link's now in the chat for the Adventures in Angular stuff. Basically, um, let's see, where was I? I'm sorry, talking a lot.
Oh, React. We were talking React, sorry. Um, so I wrote a blog post on the funnyant.com again called What is React that was pretty popular and passed around the internet quite a bit that, you know, summarizes my thoughts. I'd point people to that, but not to, you know, avoid the question here. I am still just learning React um, and trying to understand it. I feel a little bit like Backbone where it's, I'm trying really hard to like it, like understand it, you know, but, but I think I get it. Like I get that there is this group of developers, particularly who are doing a lot of mobile stuff, but still embracing the web and who really care about performance, like DOM rendering like frames per second. And, you know, they're okay writing really low level code to, um, because they have those needs. You know, they have a lot of users, these users on mobile devices with little bandwidth and so forth. So I think in those scenarios, um, you know, I'd definitely be um, looking at React. Um, for those who don't know, that's, it's a framework out of Facebook. Um, it's, but I feel like some, a framework on top of um, React may be the answer. There's Famous is also, um, Fame.us is also gaining a lot of ground in this same sort of space. I, at least mentally right now, I kind of categorize the Famous and React in the same camp. Um, and they have some real advantages when it comes to performance, but to me, they're a little close to the metal to, to be uh, productive enough in most of the, the apps I'm building. So I'm having you know, a hard time thinking about using those, but I do, I think there are real you know, scenarios where I could totally get somebody using one of those frameworks um, just to sum it up, basically. Um, so that's, that's what I'd say about that. Um, my opinion on Meteor, do I cover in the book? So Meteor is not covered in the book. I look at it, I like Meteor a lot. Um, I look at it more as it's a platform as opposed to a framework. So, you know, it's, it's tied to the, all the way back to the database, to Mongo and so forth. But it is um, very cool in its own right and it shares a lot of the common MVC patterns as this stuff. So I'm not saying don't look at it. I'm just saying this is not something I've covered or looked deeply into, although I've built a few small demos in uh, Meteor. Um, let's see, what else people are asking? Let me go back. So someone's saying... Rendered. Okay, so here's an easy one to point people in the right direction. Do you recommend any design practices that need to be followed when writing a huge Angular-based application? So there are a couple links. Um, if you Google Angular JS style guide right now, um, I'll throw a couple links into the chat window. I'll just do it right here. Um, John Papa has written a great style guide. Um, there's a competing one that was just a fork of his, um, Todd Mottos. I haven't looked at the other one that comes up on GitHub beside that, but in terms of writing larger ang Angular JS applications and file structure and uh, how you should organize, you know, your code, um, what, do you, what do you do, you know, to make sure you're not polluting the global namespace and things that'll catch up to you in larger apps, but maybe not in smaller ones. Uh, those are great resources. Um, I really like uh, John Papa's in particular um, on that. So, um, is there any mobile ready platform in AngularJS like jQuery mobile? Um, I'm losing the framework name. Yeah, so Todd Motto has a copy. Somebody's asking, is that Todd Motto has a copy of the guide that differs from um, John Papa's guide. And uh, so um, you can find that uh, link in it in John Papa's guide as well. So Ionic, yes, is the one that um, I was reading the, the question about, somebody want to ask it, is there any mobile, uh, Yasawawi? I'm probably butchered your name, sorry, but um, you want to ask your question, maybe? I probably butchered your name so bad, you don't even know who you are. Yeah, uh, <laughs> hey, yes, Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Everybody yeah. else? Yeah. So I just uh, was interested if you can uh, give any details about the mobile ready platform, just like jQuery mobile or Angular. Yes, maybe. I know there's a Ionic framework, but uh, I believe it ha it needs some Cordova dependencies. So I was just a little curious about that. Right. I'm going to 
plead the fifth on this one a little bit. Um, all I know is that it feels like people are leaning towards Ionic um, with Angular, um, but I'm not even sure that that's a, that's a great um, opinion. I know a lot of people are building apps without any, you know, sort of UI framework on top, uh, which, you know, seems like a lot of work or whatever in, in Angular. Um, so yeah, not, not a ton, can't speak a ton on, on the mobile side. Um, I think I'm out of my comfort zone there, but uh, I think what people have put in there, you know, a lot of people are basically uh, using Cordova or, um, uh, you know, what used to be PhoneGap and, uh, and Angular just raw. Um, more recently, people are starting to take a look at Ionic, um, as well as some other things, but, um, I know of nothing else that, uh, that seems to be gaining a lot of ground in that area, but I'm not a not not as familiar in the mobile space, basically. Yeah, um, okay, sorry. Thank you. Sure. Um, just want to be honest. Let's see. I'm scrolling back through the questions here. <laughs> this is pretty funny. Uh, we just had the fire alarm go off at work. Can we request the recording? So I don't know if uh, Code Mentor wants to go in there, but I believe they post the recording afterwards. They do, I think. I'm not sure if someone's gonna jump on here in a second, explain, but um, they do record this and, and put it out on the web. Um, so anybody can listen later. Back through. Um, okay, so here's, here's one about Ember. I feel like I've been Angular, Angular, Angular. So let's, here's a couple about Ember. Um, yeah, let's, Kyle B, you want to ask your question? Oh, Kyle B does not have a mic. Apologies. So I will read his thing. Thanks, Kyle, for getting in there. So he said, um, due to stricter conventions, is Ember uh, advantage long term for larger applications in terms of main maintainability of code base? Um, so I think, I think you know the Angulars and Embers of the world uh, definitely have a big advantage over the you know, backbone or something like that in terms of larger code bases and the maintainability of a code base simply because you're writing less code um, because the framework is doing so much for you, particularly in the case of Ember, because, you know, if you saw some of those examples I used before, there's a lot of convention going on there. So um, in the code, so a lot of code is just sort of, you know, being magically wired for you. And once you understand that, you know, the maintainability story goes up dramatically from an, you know, from an Angular argument, not that Ember's not testable or anything, but Ember's Angular's so testable that, you know, basically, because um, it's got the IOC stuff, uh, inversion of control dependency injection built in, that you're, uh, you've got a big plus in, in Angular's col um, column in that example. Um, but, but so I'd say, you know, either those are okay for, you know, bigger code bases, but again, you have to be disciplined, like follow things like the style guide that I just pointed to. In the Angular or Ember world, there are good ones um, out there that I've seen for Ember as well. I can't think of them off my head. Um, but I think, you know, having something that's more like a framework and less like a library is going to help you in terms of your maintainability story of your code base. Um, uh, Baksoy, ask a question. Um, you want to ask that to the group? Yeah, I was just uh, wondering what's be, what's how, what has been your observation in terms of people progressing from backbone to the next framework, if next in of course quotes. <laughs> so right. do you see do you see more people moving from backbone to Angular, or backbone to Ember, or even backbone to something else? I mean, you know, for me it would just be subjective for me to say which I see more of. But if you just look at you know online statistics like GitHub stuff and questions on Stack Overflow and so forth. And from my, you know, experience uh, in uh, picking up, you know, corporate training gigs, Angular clearly has a popularity advantage over, um, over Ember. Um, but it is still, um, 
you know, Angular took a big hit in the past few weeks with their, you know, announcement of some of their, uh, their new 2.0 version um, and Ember, you know, came out strong. I think too, that if you're in a Rails shop um, and you have a lot of Rails developers, you might want to think hard about Ember because the conventions are so similar to, to Ember because one of the creators um, of the, or one of the core contributors, not the creators of, um, uh, 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 core contributors, Yehuda Katz, let's be specific, um, is on, was on the um, jQuery core team and on the Rails core team. And now he was one of the creators of Ember with um, Tom Dale and a bunch of other people. So basically they're very uh, friendly to the Rails developer uh, until the terms of build tools and, um, you know, just development experience. So um, that that's, uh, you know, a, a, one of the cases when, when you would want to look harder at Ember. Also, you know, if you, if you really care about URLs and SEO and you still want to use one of these rich frameworks, uh, you know, Ember has the router built in. You can basically, um, you fall into the pit of success with URLs. Even if you add the Angular UI router and Angular, you basically can't, um, you not, don't necessarily uh, get led into the pit of success. You have to still be thinking URL first and, you know, will this thing be bookmarked? Will somebody hit the back button on this page? to fall into the pit of success. Whereas Ember, basically you couldn't even write the page if you weren't thinking about strongly about those URLs and so forth. So if uh, SEO is very, very important to you or, you know, URLs, um, you know, Ember has definitely got an advantage there. So just to, just to follow up on that SEO part of it, if someone already was found themselves in an Angular framework app and they now want to move, make it SEO friendly, is there other solutions for that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, just standards, right? So, but I, I made a comment earlier, I don't know if you were on the call then, that, you know, in general, SEO friendly and, and single page applications, any of these frameworks are not, are not uh, you know, sort of compatible terms. You know, you can make it work. Um, and the solutions are basically, there's a, there's like a service, for example, that's come up, uh, you know, software as a service pre-render.io that basically will allow you to um, pre-render your pages on the server so that when um, web bots crawl you, that they will still be rendered. So that's a way to sort of cope with the, you know, general single page application problems. Um, but these are, these are problems that um, Ember has as well, although there's, it's a little confusing with Ember. There's, uh, there's a newer uh, HTML bars. There's a new templating engine that's, uh, faster basically um, than their prior templating engines, but it's not string based right now. You know, uh, they use uh, handlebars and handle handlebars being string based. You can imagine you don't need an instance of a um, in memory phantom browser like phantom JS to render your pages on the server. You can just um, sort of uh, render your pages without a browser instance on the server, which has a big, you know, sort of advantage in that, that SEO category. Although, um, you know, anytime where you have to, anytime where you have to do all the server configuration, you know, to make sure your SEO is right and you have the chance of screwing it up, um, you know, it makes me quite nervous. So in general, um, thanks for posting the link to pre-render in there. And then somebody asked as a follow-up, so the SEO downfall of JS frameworks is less than an Ember versus something like Angular. And the only reason I say that is because you still have to do the server-side work. But like I said, you don't necess it's not quite as much set up to, in some, depending on which uh, templating engine you're using, to get the pages rendered on the server. And um, also, you can't, you know, it's pretty easy as a developer to forget about URLs when you're building an app and like, you know, on certain pages, forget that people deep link into a certain page. Um, whereas that's just impossible in Ember to, to not, um, the route comes first basically, right? So you have to declare your route object first when working in Ember. Um, so that is why it has a, has a strength over like Angular in that space. Um, I think we're getting close to time here, but um, I don't know if we should, anything, anybody want to vote on one they really wanted to hear the answer to here that I skipped over? Uh, 
Um, I did want to say this real quick before the code mentor people come back on. If um, you know, if you still, if you need help making this decision, um, you know, my book is at javascriptframeworkguide.com. Obviously you can go pick up a copy, or sign up for the mailing list. Um, and it, you know, you get a lot more information about whether the book is right for you. Basically. Um, if you, if on code mentor, you know, basically I wanted to throw this out there. If anybody, you know, basically books an hour of my time on code mentor, I will throw in the book and videos, um, for free, which is a hundred dollar value. Um, if you book an hour of my time, if you book, you know, two hours of my time, uh, I'd be glad to throw in the next hire package there, which has, you know, more videos, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, if you, if you book, uh, four hours, uh, there's a team package. And so I'd throw that in for free. So, but, so basically if you're you know, interested in the book, but you'd like to talk to me one-on-one -on -one about your situation, um, definitely just, um, hit me up on code mentor for a, a mentoring session of, of an hour and you can get a free copy. Um, my site link. Yeah. I'll throw that in there. So you can go to javascriptframeworkguide.com and it'll redirect to where the book is for sale at. But um, here is, here's where it redirects to. Um, and if you, um, you know, are more interested, um, yeah, so that's that. I hate to be too salesy or whatever, but uh, I hope this helped people. Um, oh yeah, someone did ask a question. Here's a, here's a good one that somebody asked even ahead of time in the comments. Um, who's more poised, you know, to handle the object.observe? Um, basically, you know, Angular and Ember are both well poised to handle um, the transition to object.observe. And ES6, um, you know, being used, I don't think one of them is, is better uh, transitioned. But so, uh, but, but they're much better uh, positioned and talked about it publicly than Backbone. Like, I don't know if you've noticed, but Backbone is, it's still got, you know, some maintenance on the project, but there's not innovation happening backbone. Backbone is what it is and it's good for what it is. It's a very light library, but there's not, you know, innovation and new frameworks, you know, features coming out. So that shows that it's, you know, sort of um, a version behind. It's not that it makes it bad, you know, a good stable framework is a good thing, but, um, but if you're looking for innovation and, and things moving forward, uh, the angulars and embers are a better choice. Thanks for all the great questions. You guys made my job easy here today. I hope I didn't miss anybody's. Um... All right, this is awesome. Um, do guys, do we have any more questions for Craig before we conclude the session? Final chance? Craig, would you take that one? Um, which one? I'm sorry. I was oh, noticing that somebody uh, was saying. <laughs> right. Um, so Nicola, um, uh -huh. if you are familiar with it, is the main.js stack going to be easier to pick up than using just AngularJS? Um, you know, I don't have a ton of familiarity with it, although, you know, a lot of the training stuff I do uses a node server, um, you know, to, cause it's easier to kind of get a, a simple web server, um, into that. So, um, you know, set up in those, in those scenarios, like training scenarios. Um, I don't know if it's going to be easier to pick up. It just might be easier, you know, to, you know, as you're working through the layers in an application, if the layers have less uh, or more, you know, if they're all JavaScript, right? Like um, closer in a, in a mean stack, then things are just going to sort of be easier for you until, till a point. So um, I think the mean stack, you know, basically, so you're saying then just using angular js or is the mean stack going to be easier to pick up than just using i would you know i personally think it's hard to learn a lot of things at once so i try to focus so in your shoes you know i would learn angular js first and uh, and then add on the the back end stuff cool all right guys so thank you so much um craig thank you so much this is great um uh, and if you if everyone has any follow-up questions for craig uh, feel free to book a session with craig and craig thanks so much for the great offer <laughs> that was really enticing thank you so cool. much cool thanks thanks for everybody have a good holiday all right thank you take care